Go ahead and take a seat, and as you're doing so, take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on and turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. So you're going to go into the New Testament, which is about two-thirds of the way into your Bible. Uh, You're going to come across four names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You want to be in John in chapter 8. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, grab one of those that are under the seats. Uh, And if you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible, put it under your arm at the end of the service, and walk out the door with it. Because we want every person to have God's Word in their home that they can read, they can reference, they can look at, that they can hear a sermon uh, from the stage and go back and make sure that what we say here is what the Bible also says. So please feel free to take one of those Bibles home with you. Now we're in the book of John, and the book of John is one of the four what are called Gospels. Uh, In the New Testament, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the accounts of Jesus' life. Uh, They are, they tell us everything from uh, what led up to Jesus' birth, all the way through his life, all the way to his ascension into heaven. Uh, And it A lot of things are recorded there. Everything that we know about Jesus' life is there. Uh, But one thing, if you've read any of the Gospels that you'll notice, is early on in Jesus' ministry, he goes out and he selects 12 men to follow him. He intentionally selects them personally to be his followers. And these 12 special followers are called his 12 disciples. The 12 guys that followed him around for his entire ministry and Jesus intentionally invested time in teaching them and preparing them to go on and be ministers themselves after Jesus ascended into heaven. And so these 12 disciples follow Jesus around for his three-year ministry. And the 12 disciples are interesting because first off, They come from all sorts of different backgrounds. Some of them are fishermen. Uh, One of them was a tax collector. I mean, every possible uh, way of life is represented uh, in the lives of the 12 disciples. Um, Also, something that is interesting about the 12 disciples, you would think that Jesus would select like 12 of the most spiritual guys that he could find around him. But in reality, we see that the 12 disciples... um, aren't known in the Gospels for making the best decisions. We'll just say that. Uh, Jesus constantly is getting on to the disciples for messing things up or asking questions that aren't in line with what he teaches or with his will. Uh, In that same line of thinking, the disciples also made a lot of bonehead choices. Um, They were stubborn. Um, They had in, in their minds the way they wanted things to go. Uh, And they pushed that a few times, even though Christ said not to. Um, At one point, Peter, who is like Jesus' right-hand man, uh, at one point, Peter, Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Uh, Because Peter makes this really dumb statement, this statement that was completely against what Jesus was doing. But then we see a shift take place. We, we see a change because when you get done with the Gospels, the very next book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the next book after John is the book of Acts. And Acts tells us all about what happens after Jesus ascended into heaven with the 12 disciples. Um, and, and what we find interesting there is there is a stark contrast in who the disciples were in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and who they are in Acts. Because suddenly, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were kind of, uh, they didn't always get it. They were kind of slow on the uptake of figuring out what Jesus wanted them to do. They were uh, kind of stubborn. And then suddenly in the book of Acts, they receive the Holy Spirit and they engage what Jesus taught them. And suddenly they become spiritual powerhouses in the name of Jesus. They, pr- they, they deliver some of the most amazing sermons in recorded history through the power of Jesus Christ. And so the disciples are really, through the world change that they initiated through Jesus, we have Christianity today. Uh, And it all started with them being Jesus' disciples. So today, we're going to talk about what it means to be a disciple, about discipleship. 
So the first thing that we've got to figure out is what is a disciple? Because let me be very honest, I don't throw around the word disciple when I'm around unchurched people. It's a church word, isn't it? It's a word that's kind of exclusive to Christianity, and here's why. The word disciple is not even an English word. It's a Greek word. If you go back, the New Testament was written all in Greek, ancient Greek, and the term, the word disciple is actually a Greek word that we took and transliterated into English. In other words, we took the pronunciation in Greek and made it as English as we could make it. And it came out as disciple. So here's what that word means. If you were to translate the Greek word disciple into English, it literally means student. So disciple equals student. So you could go into the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You could go into the four gospels and every time you saw the word disciple, you could actually literally translate that word into student. So every time that there's a reference to the 12 disciples, in your mind you can say the 12 students because that's what that word literally means. Uh, it still boggles my mind why they didn't just translate that word. I don't know. Anyways, so it means student. Now, how many of you in this room really enjoyed or currently enjoy school. School was or is your thing. A few hands go up. You're going to love this sermon. Congratulations, you came on the right weekend. How many of you in this room just really didn't like or you don't like school? School is a burden and it's not enjoyable. Buckle up, you're going to hate this message. <laughs> Strap in, it's going to be a rough road because today I'm talking about what it means to go to school with Jesus, basically. Because as a disciple, we're students. So John chapter 8, I told you to turn to John chapter 8. Open that up now. John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. And it says this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, saying... If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So translate that. You are truly my students. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, how many of you enjoy being free? We all do. You could argue that freedom is almost an idol to the American people, couldn't you? That we value freedom almost to an extreme. And so... If we want to be free, according to math, or John chapter 8, if we want to be free, what do we have to do? We have to be Jesus' student, his disciple. And so we have to take that step of saying, I will be your student. And it's not about showing up for a class, is it? Sitting in the chair that you're sitting in right now does not make you a student of Christ, does it? Being a disciple, being a student of Jesus is a lifestyle of learning and growing in Christ. It has less to do about learning facts and information, and it's much more about having a life-changing relationship with the teacher, with Jesus. So, what does a lifestyle of learning and growing in Christ look like? I'm going to give you three things this morning that encompass what a student of Christ looks like. And the first one is this. He, meaning Jesus, he chooses the courses. How many of you know that you need to be a more patient person? Yeah, every single one of us could stand to be patient. I've seen you at line and in and out. I know how you act when you're impatient. Guys, I've seen you as you've left the parking lot today. <laughs> Some of you need to learn patience a little more than others. But here's the catch. Do we enjoy learning to be more patient? Is that an enjoyable process? No. What's the funny, oh, I prayed for pa uh, patience today, and so God's really hammering me. You know, we have that kind of ongoing joke. But here's the thing. If you weren't actually investing in that, if that was something you knew you needed to be better at, but you weren't doing anything to make yourself better, it's a waste of time to know that you need to be better at it. That's why Jesus chooses the courses. 
because he knows what you need better than you know what you need. And he's willing to push you into being better when you are not willing to do it yourself. So he chooses the courses. Um, And that's not easy, is it? Because a lot of times the courses he chooses for us are difficult roads, aren't they? They're things that we don't necessarily want to do, but we know we need to do it. So we have to understand that it's not going to be easy, but it's also continuous. I had a guy in a church that I served at many years ago, and I was talking to him about something. I don't remember what we were talking about, but he looked at me during our conversation, and he said, you know what? I've read the Bible four times. I don't need to read it anymore. I pretty much know it. And in my mind, I was screaming, don't you understand? You don't get it. Because it's not about the information that you're putting in your mind. It's about having an ongoing relationship with your Savior. So let me put it in this term. Husbands, or guys that want to be a husband someday. What do you think would happen if one day you said, you know what? I really know all there is to know about my wife. I know the places she likes to eat. I know her friends. I know her hobbies. I know how she thinks. I know what she gets mad at me about. You know what? I don't need to talk to my wife anymore because I pretty much know everything there is to know about her. What's going to happen to your relationship, men? (laughs) Right? It's going to go down the toilet because it's not about the information that you know about that person. It's about the relationship with that person, right? It's the same thing with our relationship with Christ. It's not about knowing a bunch of facts from the Bible. It's about reading his word and praying and worshiping so that we can have a strong relationship with him. And the moment we stop being his student... We sever ties with that relationship because we forgot what was important. And so keep in mind, he chooses the courses and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be continuous and you just need to stick with it. So he chooses the courses that he knows we need. The next step is there is a process of learning. There is a process of learning. And that process teaches us godly character. Ooh, that's a big, fancy term, godly character. What does that mean? It means that when we go through that process of learning, we learn how to act and talk and behave and think like Christ. That's what godly character is. It's us living and thinking and behaving like our Savior. And that process involves two ways of learning. I'm going to kind of umbrella everything about Jesus' process of learning into two ways that we learn. The first way is through connection. Connection. If you go on Calvary's website and you go to the About page, you're going to find that we have four core values. Everything we do as a church centers around these four core values. And one of those core values is connection. Because we believe that life change happens in the context of connecting with God, with the family, and with the community. And so we know the connection is a vital part to being a student of Christ. And so there's two ways that we connect spiritually. The first one is that we connect to God. Okay? We have to connect to God. And I've already alluded to this a little bit. There are a few ways that we can connect with him. The first one we've been doing already, we worship. And Chad talked about this, he's already talked about this in this series. Worship is not just singing songs. It's also when we go and pray to him that we tell God just how amazing he is in our lives, right? That's praise, that's worship. But also, according to Romans 12, worship is also the life that we live. The sacrificial life that we live is our spiritual act of worship, according to Romans 12. And so our connection with God first involves worship. The second thing that it involves is reading God's word. Did you notice that in the video earlier in our worship? That uh, the, the couple, the Newtons, talked about how reading God's word began to transform their lives. Guys, we have the ultimate textbook. If you want to go back to the idea of us being a student, we have the ultimate textbook 
in the form of God's Word. But it's much more than just a book with pages. It says that it is living and active. In other words, it is a spiritual transformation tool that if you embrace it and you read it and you learn from it, it will change you from the inside out. So there's worship, there's the Bible, and then there's prayer. That's our last, last connection point with God, is if you want to connect with God, if you want to connect to your Savior, you have to be talking to Him. You have to pray. And that's that opportunity where we can come face to face with God and we can give Him our concerns, we can praise Him, we can ask for forgiveness, we can ask for help and guidance and uh, pray for our friends and our family. And uh, those are the things that we do when we pray, and it's that one-on-one relationship with our Savior. And so I talked about connection, and the first part is connecting to God. The second way we connect is to his body, to the church. We have to connect to the church. And there's a lot of people out there in culture today that says, I can be a Christian and not go to church. No, that's not what the Bible says, and I'll just call it out for what it is. Romans 12, verses 4 through 8, and also almost the entire last two-thirds of 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we're part of the body of Christ. Here's what Romans 12, 4 through 8 says. For as in one body we are many members, in other words, many parts of the body. As in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually are members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. Uh, To the one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. The idea here in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 is that we are designed to be in connection with other believers. We cannot live spiritually as hermits. We're not made to do that. So take this illustration of a body. 1 Corinthians 12 goes a little more in depth and says, you know, if the finger thinks it's just all that and a bag of chips, you know, or whatever... The, the finger can't say to the foot, you know what, I'm awesome, I don't need you anymore. The finger can't do that, because if the finger doesn't have the foot, it can't get to the place it needs to get to, to perform its function. Same is true if you take the finger and you take it off of the body, if you amputate it, does that finger continue to go on and survive and function all by itself? No. The same is true about us. We are like the finger or the eye or the toe or the kneecap. We cannot function spiritually without being part of the body of Christ. Because God's purpose is designed to be channeled through his church. And so when we sever ourselves from the church, when we do not have connection with the church, we are in violation of how God made us. And so we need to be connected to his church. So I've talked about connection, both to God and to the church. The second way that we learn, because we're talking about the process of learning, the second way we learn is through trials. Oh, trials. So let's go back to school and whether you enjoyed it or not. Even those of you who enjoyed school, was your favorite part the tests? No, nobody's favorite part is the tests. Oh, I like to learn, or I like the field trips, or I like this, or I like that, or I really like this professor. But we hate tests, don't we? But here's the catch. Let's say you're taking a class that you know you need, but you don't particularly enjoy. Are you going to do the studying necessary to really learn that information if you don't even enjoy the class? Probably not. Because you don't want to. You don't enjoy it. That's why tests and trials are necessary. That's why they're important. It's because they push us and they, they challenge us to grow more in Christ in a way that we wouldn't do on our own. We need 
those tests. So look at what Romans 5, verses 3 through 5 says about this. It says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings and trials, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How many of you just love to live in hopelessness? That's what we all long for, right? Hopelessness. I just want to live my life in utter and total hopelessness. No, we all long for hope. As a matter of fact, there are points in every one of our lives in this room, including my own, where hope is the only thing that got us through, right? Hope is not just something we want. In many ways, hope is something we need. But what does this passage say about hope? Hope, in order to have it, you've got to have character. Okay, but in order to have character, you've got to have endurance. Oh, okay, okay, but in order to have endurance, oh, you've got to go through the trials. In other words, if you want hope, you're going to allow God to put you through the fire a little bit. Because through the trials, we come out better. We come out stronger. We come out with a closer relationship with our Savior. So the trials are necessary. But let me ask you this. What's the best part? Uh, testing's not any fun. But when you're taking a test, what's the best part? Passing or failing? Passing, of course. Uh, when I was in seminary, which is school for preachers, when I was in seminary, I was forced, because I didn't want to take it, I was forced to take ancient Hebrew, because the entire Old Testament is written in ancient Hebrew, so they wanted us to know how to work in ancient Hebrew so that we could better, uh, you know, cut through God's word and understand it better. So, I remember very distinctly, I was, it was like the final test, and the final test was this, we had to sit down with the entire book of Jonah, all four chapters of Jonah, written only in the original Hebrew language. And I had to translate sections that were randomly selected by the professor. I had to take those Hebrew sections and translate them into English. That was part of my test. And I studied for two and a half weeks leading up to this test, because let's face it, I'm not good at languages. I can barely speak English. So... I studied for two and a half weeks leading up to this test, and I remember going in, taking the test, handing it in, going, I think I did okay. And then a few days later, got the results, and sure enough, I had passed. And my wife and I celebrated. Like, my wife took me out that night. We had a night and celebrated the fact that I passed that test. How amazing is it for each one of us when God puts us through a trial a difficult time where he's teaching us something and we come out of it and we've learned and grown closer to Christ and we look back and go, oh, that's why God put me through that. Thank you, Jesus. When we pass, it's a time for rejoicing. But the trials are necessary for us to learn and grow. So he chooses the courses that he knows we need and there's a process of learning. Thirdly, there is an outcome. There is an outcome in this process of learning. Because what's the point in studying for something and not actually applying what we studied? What's the point in getting a degree in electrical engineering and then turning around and flipping burgers at In-N-Out? Nothing wrong with flipping burgers at In-N-Out. It's one of my favorite places in town, but... If I have a degree in electrical engineering, I'm not using that degree, am I? No. And so what was the point of me taking all those classes, spending all that money and all that time, if I'm not going to even apply the degree that I've got? I hope I don't offend anyone, because I'm sure some of you in this room got a degree and you're not doing anything close to what that degree is for. It's not the point. The point is here is that when we go through things, when Christ is teaching us things, he then calls us to go apply the things we've learned. He wants us to use what he's taught us. What does James chapter 1 verse 22 say? It says this, but be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Don't deceive yourself and think you can just hear God's word and then not apply it. That's 
That's you lying to yourself. James says, hear God's word, learn from it, and then go out in the world and apply what you've learned from Jesus. And so we have to have an outcome. We have to have an application uh, to our learning. So go and do it. Apply the lessons you've learned and then change the world as a result of that because that's what will happen. If you take what Jesus has taught you and the transformation that he has done inside you, you will go then out and change the world in the name of Jesus Christ. People will come to know him because they see, they hear, they know the Savior through you. They will see, you will be the light of the world. You will be the hands and feet of Christ in your community and the people who you're around. You'll be that light in their darkness. And so go apply what he's taught you and change the world for Jesus. Now, that is our purpose, to go change the world for Jesus. That's our purpose. And that purpose will always stay the same. But the way you apply, the way you um, live out that purpose may change over time. So for example, seven years ago, I was hired by Calvary Baptist Church to be their student pastor. Today, I am not the student pastor at Calvary Baptist Church. It's not that I got fired. It's not that I stopped doing my job. It's that over the last several years, God has changed my heart and has altered my passions. I still have a huge passion for students. Uh, don't get me wrong there. I, I, I love hanging out with students, but I now have a stronger passion for children and for families and for parents and marriages and, and for foster children and those different things like that. So it was a natural progression for me to shift from being the student pastor to the family pastor for Calvary Baptist. I'm still living the same purpose, I'm just living it in a slightly different way than I was seven years ago. And so it may change a little bit over time. So I've talked about the process of being a student, being a disciple for Christ, but what does that look like? How do you study? No one likes to study, I don't think. Nobody likes to study, but That's part of the process here. So how do we grow in Christ? How do we study? I've already mentioned a few things. Uh, Worship, read your Bible, pray, but also get plugged in to a small group. Guys, we're gonna have signups again for our life groups here in just a few more weeks. Uh, And if you're not plugged into one, get plugged in because imagine what will happen. Uh, Imagine the scenario. You're living life as a Christian and all of a sudden, you begin spending a, more time with other believers talking about Christ every single week. What do you think is going to happen with your relationship with Christ? It's going to go up. It's going to increase. It's going to be stronger because you're living life in connection with other believers as part of the body of Christ, like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 tells us to. So get plugged into a life group here at Calvary. Get connected with a small group of believers that you can live life together. Uh, The other one, we already mentioned it. Maybe some of you need to get baptized. Maybe you are a follower of Christ and you have never stepped into the waters of baptism. Christ calls you to do that. Read the end of Matthew 28. He says, once you become a believer, then go get baptized. So maybe that's the next step for you. I don't know. But the point is, is that we need to go and live for Christ. It's not enough to just learn. We have to go then apply and live our lives for him. And so my challenge to you today is find what you need to be doing, whether it's, you know, reading your Bible or praying or worshiping or getting it plugged into a life group that is going to spur you on to then go live, to think, to act, to talk like Jesus so that you can lead others into that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you join me in prayer?